Well, welcome to our last forum until uh, next October, at least the last forum I'll be doing until next October. Um, so I'm glad everyone was able to come out. Uh, today, I thought we'd end with somebody who's only two years older than I am, uh, a fellow retired theologian, <laughs> um, Sarah Coakley, who's a feminist Anglican theologian and also a priest. Um, she had a very distinguished, or has had a very distinguished uh, academic career. She taught at Harvard for a number of years. And then at Cambridge, she had a wonderful endowed chair there. And now since she's retired, she's at St. Andrews University at the Logos Institute there. She's, she's writing a multi-part systematic theology. Volume one has already come out. And I'll be drawing a lot from that in my talk today. Uh, and interestingly enough, she had a desire to be ordained as a priest. In the, night, in the late 1990s and was finally ordained as a priest in 2001. And as part of her priestly formation, she did clinical pastoral education, which is a very intensive year in a hospital. Um, and she also did a year of prison ministry in the United States in Boston. And she said those two experiences were utterly transformative to her. The, and academic theologians don't usually do that. They usually you know, sit in their offices and read a lot of books. And, uh, and so her exposure to the kinds of things that you experience in CP and also in prison ministry shows up in her understanding of the human person. She was also deeply um, affected by the racism she saw in the, in the criminal justice system in the United States and also which she sees in England to a, uh, a degree there as well. So her next volume is gonna be on, on anthropology and she'll be addressing those issues there. Her major sources, it's really interesting that she wound up being uh, landing on Trinity Sunday. I had no idea that I was doing that at the time, but she's a major uh, thinker about how to reinvigorate the understanding of the Trinity in our day, especially as a feminist. So you have this major high hurdle immediately, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you use that language. If you can't, what do we do instead? If you can, how do we use it in a way that's not idolatrous or, idolatrous or patriarchal? And she takes as her lead, interestingly enough, Paul's description of prayer and the spirit in Romans 8. And uh, so I thought it, would, it was worth reading this because she thinks this experience that Paul talks about of praying in the spirit or the spirit praying in us is actually the root of where the Trinity came from. Um, so Paul says in Romans 8, all who are led by the spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, and now you can see why she's interested in this, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then further, Paul says, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know, know how to pray as we ought. But that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the spirit because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. In her description of this prayer, she says, what is being described in Paul is one experience of an activity of prayer that is nonetheless ineluctably, though obscurely, triadic, in other words, threefold. It is one experience of God, but God as simultaneously one, doing the praying in me, receiving that prayer, and in that exchange, consented to in me, inviting me into the Christic life of redeemed sonship. So there's the threefold. So God is inviting me in by the spirit to the, to the Christic life of sonship. Or to put it another way, the Father, so-called here, is both the source and ultimate object of divine longing in us. The Spirit is that irreducibly, though obscurely, distinct enabler and incorporator of that longing in creation, that which makes the creation divine. And the Son is that divine and perfected creation into whose life I, as prayer, am caught up. It's a very interesting approach to uh, the Trinity and to the, the theological life, actually. And so um, I think it's worth, it's worth keeping that in mind. It's not something I have ever thought of myself, that the, the Romans 8 is, a, is the root of the Trinity. But that also shows you that as a theologian, 
<clears throat> she's very interested in the discipline of prayer and the mystery of prayer. The other source for her is really quite a remarkable passage in Pseudo Dionysius, who we looked at it, uh, earlier this um, fall. Um, and in this passage, Pseudo Dionysius says that the word love, when we talk about God, is actually better understood as yearning, desire, but yearning. I think yearning is even stronger than desire. Um, so, so uh, and he knows this is a controversial thing to say. He says, to those who listen to write to Holy Scripture, the word, this is Pseudo Dionysius now, the word love is used by the sacred writers in divine revelation with the same meaning as the word yearning. It means a faculty of unifying and conjoining and of producing a special commingling together in the beautiful and the good, a faculty which pre exists for the sake of the beautiful and good and is diffused from this origin and to this end and holds together all things by mutual connection. And he goes on to say that this divine yearning brings ecstasy. So it brings ecstasy to us when we experience it. And Paul says, I live, nevertheless not I, but Christ lives in me. That's Paul being ecstatically united to Christ in this desire. But God also experiences ecstasy. God is also drawn out of God's self by this yearning and by this desire toward the universe. He says, we must dare to affirm, for it is the truth, that the creator of the universe himself, in his beautiful and good yearning toward the universe, isn't that interesting? God yearns toward the universe, is through the excessive yearning of his goodness, transported outside of himself in his providential activities toward all things that have being, and is touched by the sweet spell of goodness, love, and yearning. And so is drawn from his transcendent throne above all things to dwell within the heart of all things through a super essential and ecstatic power whereby God yet stays within God's self. So the difference between human yearning and divine yearning is that God, both are drawn outside of themselves by the yearning, but God remains in God's self even when God is ecstatically outside of God's self. And we don't. We, we tend to depart ourselves in that way. Hence, the doctors, the theological teachers, call God zealous because God is vehement in God's good yearning toward the world and because God stirs up people to a zealous search of yearning desire for God. Right. So God's yearning is also then the source of our yearning for God. It's a really interesting passage, actually, very interesting. And these two passages, one having to do with prayer and the spirit, and the other having to do with pseudo Dionysius on desire in God, really form the root of Sarah Copley's theology. Because what she's trying to do is recover a positive meaning of human desire, but a, but a positive meaning of human desire that also transforms human desire. Right, so she doesn't just endorse all the human desires we have. Uh, she also thinks that they need to be transformed. So they're awakened by God, but they're also transformed by God. Um, but she has this really interesting quote at the top of the page, uh, of page one that I she repeats in several different works. So it's clearly important to her. As you may know, Sigmund Freud thought that when we when we use the word God, what we're really talking about is sex. And so we should just get rid of thinking about God and just talk about human sex, right? And so the kind of intimacy we want with God is actually the kind of intimacy we want with one another. And she thinks this is exactly wrong, like precisely wrong. She says, first, first Freud must be, as it were, turned on his head. It is not that physical sex is basic and God ephemeral. Rather, it is God who is basic and desire the precious clue that ever tugs at the heart reminding the human soul, however dimly, of its created source. So all of our desires that tug at us remind us of uh, what we should be desiring, which is God, that our source is in God. And then she says, hence, desire is more fundamental than sex. And she thinks that Americans in particular, she was very surprised when she got over here and taught at Harvard, that when American Christians talk about sex, they talk about genitals. Like they're talking about intercourse of some kind. And in England, when they talk about sex, they mainly meant sexuality, sexual desire, sort of a, a, a much broader uh, category. 
So she says, so that's why she says desire is more fundamental than sex. I think she's actually talking to Americans at that point. Um, and maybe because we're so saturated with pornography in our country that we think of that immediately. But anyway, uh, so, so you can see there's kind of a cultural, not kind of, there's a strong cultural criticism going on here as well. It is Desire is more fundamental ultimately because desire is an ontological category. It's a category of being belonging primarily to God. So you can see there she's getting that right from Pseudo-Dionysius. So when we were to use the word desire, desire properly belongs to God. And that's a really interesting statement, actually. Uh, and only secondarily to humans as a token of their createdness in the divine image. Right? So we have desire because the God who created us has desire, and our desire is an image of God's desire, at least it should be. But in God, desire, of course, signifies no lack, and that's pseudo Dionysius's point, too as it manifestly does in humans. So when we desire something and we yearn for something, we usually yearn for it because we don't have it, right? God yearns for something that God already has. I think that's really fascinating. So it's a fullness of God's love, of God's goodness that leads God to desire. It isn't a lack that's leading to this desire as it is in ours. She says, rather it connotes the plenitude of longing love that God has for God's own creation and for its full and ecstatic participation in the divine Trinitarian life. So God ecstatically goes outside of God's self toward creation and wants creation in ecstasy, if you will, to participate in God's triune life. Um, so that's really the basic rhythm of her, of her theology. But, but she's also aware, and I think this makes her a really interesting person, it's very similar actually from a feminist point of view to what we saw with Howard Thurman from um, an African-American point of view, and that is uh, the disinherited ex have, so have certain experiences in their disinheritedness that need to be corrected, that Jesus actually comes to correct those. So when they fear other human beings, he teaches them to fear God. When they, uh, when they hate and revile in response, they should actually love those who are oppressing them. Similarly, Sarah Coakley is aware that he, just by saying our desires are an image, you know, are an indication that we're the image of God does not mean that all our desires are actually right. We know they're not. And if anything else should reveal that to us, it's the, the different sex scandals that have ripped through all of our churches. Now, the Southern Baptist Convention, earlier the Roman Catholic Church. But for her, this indicates a very real truth, which is a dirty secret in religious life, and that is religious longing and sexual longing are almost inseparable. They're completely entangled and it's very hard to sort them out, right? And so our desires are a sign of God's desire. And on the other hand, our desires are a mess, right? They're a mess and we need them to be purged, if you will. We need to be transformed. We need to be in some ways broken. And so she, she talks about this, um, in the third quote down on the first page. One might say then of human engagement with God at its most profound, that the spirit progressively breaks sinful desires in and through the passion of Christ. And so you can see this, you know, here's the Trinitarian thing as well. God breaks desires through the spirit, uh, through the passion of Christ. And hence at the pastoral practical level where you and I live, uh, what I shall call the spirit's pro proto-erotic pressure felt initially as a propulsion toward divine union must inexorably bring also as the spirit of the sun the chastening of the human lust to possess, abuse, and control. And those become kind of the three markers of where our desires go wrong. And we'll look at how she tries to undo that from this point on. But it's possess, where is it again? Possess, abuse, and control. So that's where human desires go astray. God never does that. God doesn't possess, God doesn't abuse, and God doesn't control in that way. This breaking, stopping, and chastening is a necessary prelude to the participatory transformation of all human and often misdirected longings so that they become one with God, right? So she's aware that our desire, just to say, we have desire, but this desire is ultimately rooted in God, doesn't mean, oh, that's great. 
So all of our desires are divine, and we can now just follow our desires, and that's a divine life. It's like, oh, our desires are really a mess, right? There's such a mess, it's going to take a lifetime of what she calls on the next page. I love this line. An arduous and sometimes torturous lifetime's endeavor to untangle all this stuff. So it's a, so it's a not just happy, clappy, good news, let's follow our desires. Although it is saying that our desire is a God-given gift to us, that's to lead us to intimacy with God, right? To participation in God's desire and to be transported outside of ourselves into God and God ecstatically transported outside of God's self toward us. So it is, there is a positive message to it, but it's not just straight out flat, you know, everything's fine. And the key then is the practice of contemplative prayer. And she's adamant about this. Actually, she thinks that the Christian life is impossible without contemplative prayer. Because in contemplative prayer, you willingly surrender control to God. You surrender control willingly. So you're not raped, right? She's very aware of this as a woman. It's a willing surrender of control to God, not to a priest, not to a spiritual director, not to a church, to God but it's a willing surrender to God. So she's very, uh, very emphatic on this. And then, so the paragraph right after the one I read, it gets, uh, gets at her, um, at this understanding of how we free ourselves from possession, abuse, and control. She says, the willingness to endure a form of naked dispossession, dispossession before God. So we willingly allow ourselves to be completely vulnerable before God. The willingness to surrender control not to any human power, but solely to God's power. The willingness to accept the arid vacancy of the simple waiting on God in prayer, which is often what prayer feels like. You're waiting in an empty room for Godot. Right? <laughs> Godot is a little late. He'll be here any minute, right? Um, and so she thinks that's very much on purpose because the, God will do that so that we let go of control. Prayer isn't grasping God. Prayer is surrendering to God, right? The willingness at the same time to accept disconcerting bombardments from the realm of the unconscious. And this is also what happens. We, things emerge in our minds when we're praying contemplatively that are really quite scary, actually. It's like, where did that come from? You know, so, so she's aware of that, right? So all of this, you have to be willing to undergo all of this. That for her is, uh, is key. She says, all these are the ascetical tests of contemplation. So ascetic means self-denying. The ascetical test of con contemplation without which no epistemic or spiritual deepening can start to occur. So she's very, she's very aware of the problem with human desires, which is control, abuse, and possession. And she's also aware we need to do something about it other than just analyze it, right? And so what her, her solution, if you will, is, is contemplative prayer. Uh, on your knees before a God who seems uh, to dwell in thick darkness. She loves that image, actually, and uh, who, who dwells in a cloud of unknowing and surrendering ourselves to that power, that power of desire and that power of love is, in fact, the key to the transformation of our own desires. Yeah. So as you just pointed out, that in the contemplative life, and this mirror is completely what she was talking about, when this, it's almost like this divine surcharge of energy hits you in contemplation, you long to possess God as an object. Am I translating what you said correctly? Yeah. There's, a, there's an awakening in desire. She calls it this proto-erotic desire that the spirit awakens in us. But that can be actually really problematic, right? Because that can actually lead you to try to possess God. And especially when you, when you really do experience the liberating presence of being upheld by God, you want that, right? That's what you want. So then you can try to manipulate that and reproduce it. And now you're back in the trap. That's an idol. Anything that can be produced by human control is an idol. Anything that can be uh, abused by human control is an idol. And we're, we're filled with idols. So, so the contemplative path is actually a way of freeing, of, it's actually a way of opening ourselves up to God to free us from our own idolatry, which is nearly infinite, right? We can turn anything into an idol because of that grasping. But that's a really good point. And she, she's very aware of that. And the other thing that can happen is that this awareness, this experience of the spirit within you can lead to literally erotic behavior, 
sexually erotic behavior because the two are so closely, and she would say completely entangled, that when you're first starting on this journey, they feel like they're the same thing. And so you, you need discernment, you need really negation, <laughs> the negation of God's you know, darkness to begin to separate between the two. But the, so, so, and then the spiritual tradition, she points out all the places in the tradition where, where the writers like Origen want to use the Song of Songs, my beloved is mine, is mine and I am is, but then they get really nervous because they know how erotic, and I mean literally erotic, the spiritual life is. The spiritual life awakens our deepest desires, including sexual desire. And therefore, it's a really dangerous thing when you start to unleash that. That's why the ascesis is important. The discipline is important. The transformation is important. On the other hand, endorsing the desire, right? The desire is ultimately rooted in God and should be directed to God. That's also important. So to tell people just to shut down all the desires they have doesn't, doesn't work. And she doesn't, she doesn't believe that's possible. So, and, so the question was, is, isn't prayer directed toward God? <clears throat> and it sounds like she's just sort of shooting darts into the air and hoping it hits something, right? Um, yeah, for her, for her, prayer is not primarily petitional, right? So we, I think you're talking about his petitionary prayer, where you pray to God, uh, please heal my husband from his brain tumor. I mean, 99.99% of the prayers we say together in church are petitions. Uh, and usually for illness, right? We have a very hard time of talking about I'm subject to addiction or I, I go online all the time and I'm addicted to pornography, right? Or I have all sorts of, you know, I, I tend to abuse people in my sexual way. We don't talk about stuff like that. So it's like usually we're innocent. You know, I got cancer. What did I do to get that? But still, they're petitionary prayers. So that would be a form of prayer. This petitionary prayer, and you're absolutely right, that would be directing, opening your heart to God and laying your request before God. And you would certainly hope that it wouldn't just be this kind of random thing. But what she's talking about in contemplative prayer is actually the opposite. It's actually opening yourself to God's presence and not doing anything, not asking anything, not wanting anything. Uh, and because that would be controlling and that would be ambitious, if you will, as she would say. And, and this gets, she gets at this, and, and this may not be everybody's cup of tea, right, to, to be an Anglican this way. Um, but, but you can see why she would see contemplative prayer as a route to take to get to realign our desires um, and, to, and to free ourselves from abuse, control, and possession. Uh, she says on the very last um, quote, this turn toward divine desire is itself transformative. So what we're turning toward is desiring God and God's own desire, not only a particular human desires, but also the very capacity to think, feel, and imagine. So it, it transforms everything. It doesn't just transform your desires, it transforms your thoughts, it transforms your imagination, and it transforms your feelings. What is here playfully called the apophatic turn, that means toward the non-knowing, is not limited merely to the linguistic negations, like, you know, God is not this, God is not that, Rather, what is blanked out in the regular patient attempt to attend to God in prayer, now notice that, you're attending to God in prayer. You're not directing prayers to God. You're directing yourself to God, right? What is, uh, what is uh, blanked out in the regular patient attempt to attend to God in prayer is any sense of human grasp. And what comes to replace such an ambition over time, and again, it's not going to happen immediately, is the elusive but nonetheless ineluctable sense of being grasped. So instead of grasping, over time you sense you're being grasped. Of the spirit's simultaneous erasure of human idolatry, that would be the grasping, and the subtle reconstitution of human selfhood in God. So what it means to be a human self in God is not to be a controlling person, not to be a grasping person, not to be an ambitious person, not certainly to be an abusive person, but to be one who is being grasped. There's a, there's a wonderful story that Henry Nouwen, who's a spiritual writer in the Roman Catholic tradition, of many of you may know, he told a friend of mine, and I think it's just a marvelous thing, he said he loved being a clown. I don't know if you're clowning in Rome is one of the books he wrote, and he loved the circus. And so he was really excited. They, they let him at one point go on the trapeze and you'd swing on the trapeze, and then the other person was the catcher swinging on the trapeze. And they said, now, when you, when you uh, 
let go when you are flying toward the other person. Of course, it was above the net and they weren't very high up, but silly. So when you fly toward the other person, you have to let the other person catch you. And Henry goes, fine. That's, yeah, okay, I got that. So he lets go, and of course he's like, <laughs> and he fell. He fell. It was a disaster. And the guy said, you didn't let yourself be caught. And Henry Nouwen said, that's the relationship to God. Let yourself be caught. And so the next time he did it, it was totally counterintuitive. He just opened his hands, right? And the guy grabs him. And he said it was just magical. Like this energy, this momentum in him went into the arms of the person catching him. It wasn't, he wasn't trying to pull the guy toward him. He let his energy go into that. And so I think that's what she's talking about, actually. When the spirit prays in us with size too deep for words, and notice when the spirit prays in us, we lose control. We don't have the language anymore. We don't have the reason anymore. We don't have the volition anymore. It's praying in us with size too deep for any of that. And when that happens, then you're, and it doesn't happen all the time, and she's aware how elusive it can be. But when that happens, that's when you lose control. That's when you let yourself be grasped. But I always loved that that story by Henry because it was so it was so honest too. <laughs> like, that would that be me? I'd be flailing through the air, grabbing for the first thing I could find. So, um, so yeah. So, so then she looks through the Christian tradition to people who see this, right? And one of the people she loves is a person we did earlier, Gregory of Nyssa. Especially when Gregory of Nyssa talks about Moses going into the darkness at the top of Mount Sinai, where he goes beyond, it's a knowing beyond reason, and it's a seeing beyond vision in this darkness where God dwells. And uh, she says that, that in the what, third full quote on the second page, at the, at the symbolic heart of Gregory, and this would be Gregory of Nyssa's system, is a very particular kind of loss of control a yielding to the unknown God in a desire without end. So properly understood, properly awakened, properly ordered desire is yielding control to God, but in a desire. So this does, answering your question, this does actually lead you to God, right? The desire leads you to God, but it's a desire that will never come to an end. And then her question that she has for both Gregory of and Augustine is whether or not that kind of desire can have an analogy in sexual desire, right? Can sexual desire be brought into harmony with our desire for God, or are they mutually exclusive? And throughout most of the Christian tradition, they're mutually exclusive, right? So when, when the desire for God finally awakens in you, you abandon, like Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Avila did, you abandon sexual relations, right? Because your sexual relation, if you will, is with God or Benedict of Nursia or any of the people we looked at. All of them were celibate, right? Every single one of them were celibate because for them, the desire for God trumps all other desires. And so there's a negation of the things we desire like property, houses, family, cars, all of it. You give it all up, right? For your desire for God. So her question is, is that necessarily so? Or as she says, can there be an analogical alignment of sexual desire and desire for God rather than demanding a disjunctive choice between them? In other words, once that desire for God really awakens, and it's very powerful when it does, do you then have to give up all other desires, especially sexual desire? And her whole work is to say, no, you don't. Right? No, you don't. And she's looking for places in the tradition where people say that. I don't find it in Pseudo Dionysius or Augustine or, or Gregory of Nyssa, but I applaud her for trying. Well, there would, I mean, there's certainly room for petitionary prayer, but in her mind, it's contemplative prayer that is transformative in this way. Petitionary prayer doesn't free you from control. Actually, it could do the opposite. <laughs> because you could think in making this petitionary prayer, I'm controlling God. And when it does, when the outcome doesn't come, then I get frustrated, right? So, so she's not denying the role of petitionary prayer, but that's absolutely not what she's talking about. Don't get me wrong. She's a priest, right? So she has a book of common prayer. She goes through the prayers all the time, uh, intercessions, et cetera. But what she's talking, contemplative prayer is really a different discipline than petitionary prayer. It's a very different discipline. It's a whole different thing altogether. Yeah, yeah, because it's it's letting go. You don't have in contemplative prayer. You don't have an agenda when you approach God. And it's more likely to take over your life and not. Well, it's meant to open your. It's what you're trying to do is open your life up to God, 
right? And, and, and it's a form of vulnerability that really goes quite deeply. So, no, that's exactly no, that's, <laughs> that's All I can say is amen, right? Was, I just wish everyone could have heard it. I'm trying to summarize that there were two things actually that were, were said that were really beautiful, and they're very much on point. Uh, one is the desire to see God. And I skipped this quote because um, I, for the sake of time, although I cruise pretty well. So, um, so at the bottom of page one, she goes right to this question of Moses trying to see God's face. One of the desires that the, that the spirit awakens in us and our transformation in, in to more and more of the image of God is we desire to see God. And so one of the things that needs to be transformed is our imagination. And so on the one hand, God awakens in us this desire to see God's face, right? And then God thwarts it. <laughs> so, so Moses wants to see God, and that, that seems to be a good thing. And God doesn't condemn him for that, if I understood you correctly, that's true. But he also doesn't give it to him, right? And so the, the quote, uh, she says, it may not be clear why an ascetic perception of theology, and ascetic means this kind of disciplined denial, leads inexorably into an examination of what it could mean in theology to see the divine face, to explore with intensity the fundamental religious desire to see God, yet constantly to have that desire chastened and corrected right? The double pressure of the spirit is once more felt, building up and breaking down. So that longing and being thwarted, and long, but not being totally thwarted, right? So it doesn't do away with the longing to see, but it's thwarted now. That's the breaking down. But then the building up is the longing for it. She thinks that's the way we're transformed. And if we were given what we desire right away, then we would just remain the same proud arrogance, you know? <laughs> idolatrous people that we are. So no, that, that in particular is a, is a very important theme. In her book, she actually has an entire large chapter on iconography on the Trinity, right? <laughs> because she thinks that this idea that painting pictures of the Trinity is idolatrous, she thinks that's really naive, that, that the images can actually help transform our imagination and also reveal things about our imagination that need transforming. Right, so it's very so it's a really really good point. But none of those images, and this goes to the divine darkness, none of those images come close to capturing the reality that is God. And that's why she loves the what's called the apophatic tradition, the luminous darkness in which God dwells. That's her. Uh, that's what contemplative prayer opens you up to. No, and that's and that's a that's a really good point. So the beauty. The beautiful, you know, because one of the categories of this is beautiful would be in the nature, right? So in a sense, nature is the face of God because of God's presence there. And then, and then the other thing, and this goes to pseudo is God's longing is for all of the universe, right? It isn't just for human beings. And so opening yourself up when you, when you hit periods of aridity, right? When things just don't seem to be overflowing very well, becoming aware of your place in the cosmos and God's relationship to all of creation, the whole universe, and God's desire for the whole universe. I mean, pseudo is really strong in this. This would be Sarah as well, Sarah Coakley as well. And that's why she's really interested in one another thing she does a lot of work in is faith and science or theology and science. Because she thinks science can open up theologians to the infinite majesty of God in creation. Right. And that's that that so that goes right to your point. And that, uh, Howard Thurman talked about that too. What do you do when the channel of the spirit, the the uh the hunger of the heart goes dry? And he talks about how walking on the beach at night was one of his ways of getting that hunger alive again. It's very interesting to me, actually. They don't know each other at all, but both of them are talking in the 20th century, 21st century about reawakening the hunger of the heart for God. And what it would mean for us if that happened. I didn't know that when I picked them for the last two readings, but but there's kind of this wonderful echo chamber between the two of them. So no, I, yeah, that, that has occurred to many people. In fact, Freeman Schultz was sort of one of our favorite artists in town. He's very interested in fractals. Um, my wife loves fractals, so you're on her way like as well. And one of her favorite fractals is the opening of a fern, you know, fiddlehead of fern, and you see the pattern, but then you see that pattern all over the place. You're absolutely right. And that is one of the things, there are many people, I don't know that Sarah Coakley mentions this, but it certainly fits with our theme, that that's one of the clues, if you will, uh, that there's this divine desire uh, behind all of creation. So um, no, that's a one, and so fractals are really interesting. Um, there, are, there are astrophysics, physicists who think 
that they all go back to the Big Bang. Right? These patterns started with the Big Bang, and they just keep repeating themselves through the universe. I think there's a lot to be said for that. So, no, exactly. So, petitionary prayer is perfectly fine, but her focus is contemplative prayer. And the fact that she says contemplative prayer means she knows that it's one form of prayer, right? So, but she's adamant about that, actually. So when we she, there's an interview, she, she's another wonderful person to hear on a YouTube interview, and she has a whole bunch of interviews posted on YouTube. And one of them is with a philosopher about the problem of atheism. And when she, and she says, well, I would just invite the atheists to start practicing contemplative prayer, right? So, so because otherwise you're just talking about an idea that may or may not be out there, and you're not really you're not really grasping what a Christian's talking about when the Christian talks about God. But the, so the other thing, and the thing that I find her very interesting about is. Uh, or with regard to is the, her awareness of our need to have our desires fundamentally transformed, right? So that's, she keeps returning to over and over again. Like she said uh, on the first page, um, that God breaks our sinful desires through Christ or the breaking, stopping and chastening of our desires. There's this wonderful passage on the second page, like one, two, three, four up on the bottom, which brings this kind of apophatic unknowing that we were talking about earlier uh, together with this. <clears throat> she says, to bring different desires into true alignment in God. I think that's really interesting. What we want to do is bring our desires into alignment so that they actually form a fractal pattern and not just chaos, right? So different desires into true alignment in God cannot be done without painful spiritual purgation and transformation. Right? So this isn't something that's easy, and this isn't something straightforward. Without the power of grace, and then I love this sense, without the dizzying adventure into the ecstasy of divine unknowing. Right. So she clearly, and there are, there are other people who wouldn't find this such a, such a wonderful prospect, but she clearly is tapping into the pseudo Dionysius um, divine unknowing. And then she says, do we know? <clears throat> when it is proper to abandon the crutches of spiritual infirmity and contempt and confidently embrace engagement with a God whose darkness is dazzling, right? So when can we let go of all the things that we're clinging to and just let go of God in the darkness? And then she makes a very interesting statement. The contemplative on her knees well knows the messy entanglement of sexual desire and the desire for God. And so that's one of the entanglements she thinks it takes the longest to work through. <laughs> and um, and that's what the practice of contemplative prayer for her is a lifelong arduous task. It isn't something that's just uh, straightforward, but it isn't meaning. And, and Jean is right. She isn't a polemicist against petitionary prayer. It's just that petitionary prayer isn't going to get the kind of realignment of desire because our petitionary prayers don't challenge our desires at all. Right? I mean, I don't want my wife to be sick. I don't want so-and-so to suffer. I don't want gun violence to go on. I mean, that's, I don't need my desires transformed in that regard, I think. Um, uh, so that's, that's uh, something that she's, she's very aware of. And then finally, she thinks, and this is a very, a very provocative uh, thesis, she thinks that the practice of contemplative prayer is actually a feminist practice, right? That it, that it brings, it brings the critique of father-son language right to the heart of the matter, if you will, in the, in the confrontation with God's own unknowableness, but that it then frees you to be able to use that language without it hurting you, right? Without it hurting you. And she's aware that there are a lot of women for whom this language and the patriarchy of the church and power structures and abuse and all of these things have really severely damaged and made Christianity almost like just unapproachably awful. Um, and so for her, the, this surrender, this voluntary surrender to God's desire is actually, can be a very healing thing, right? Can be a very healing thing, which can actually allow you then to start using language you never thought you could use before yet. Yeah. She's aware of that. Yeah, so the question is, is she aware that the, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is certainly feminine in the tradition. She's also aware of the attempt in the Episcopal and the Anglican Church to add mother language, and as a mother leads her children with cords of compassion, et cetera. And initially she was sympathetic to that, and now she's really suspicious because that's just 
that's just playing with names. That's not critiquing what you're actually doing when you're naming God. And so she thinks that adding mother, first of all, there are a lot of people, women in particular, who've been traumatized by their mothers. So just calling mother, Godmother, or Jesus mother, or the Holy Spirit mother, okay. Um, Calvin calls God mother in various places. Uh, Julian of Norwich calls Jesus mother. And was, oh, Nicholas Ludwig Kambanzinsen, of course, is the Holy Spirit mother. And none of that, in her mind, is going to solve anything, right? Because, because mothers can be as problematic as fathers. They can be abusive and controlling and all that. Secondly, we're, we're, we're still playing in the creature. We're still not aware of how unknowable God actually is, right? So we're, we're just, it's window dressing. It doesn't solve the problem of idolatry. Because if you think God is a mother, that's an idol, that's as much of an idol as father, or if it's a mother and father, that's an idol too, right? So, so, um, so, it, it, but with regard to since it's Trinity Sunday, we'll just end with this um, this thought: Can can a feminist, she asks, use this language of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? She says, if one asks, does this approach, and her approach that is, leave everything as it is in terms of the traditional naming of God? The answer is yes and no but above all, no. No, first and foremost, because in the mysterious ongoing of contemplative surrender to Dionysius' ray of divine darkness, so notice that you're surrendering, that's the whole theme, is to surrender. The psychic bags and baggage which we bring in, in our prayer, its hauntings by parents, lovers, and friends, good and bad, saintly and sinful, is by slow degrees retrieved, sorted, and held up for healing. Of course, this is an arduous and sometimes tortuous lifetime endeavor. So for her, yes and no, but primarily no, because this encounter with the divine darkness heals all of these traumas that have taken place in one uh, through all these human relationships that have made the naming of God so problematic. So I think that's a really beautiful recognition. I mean, that's really her goal. Her goal is healing, right? Right, right. So give me your desires in my heart. That would be, that would, that's actually, so another way of saying that is not what you will, but uh, not what I will, but what you will, right? So Jesus is prayer, but I like that even better because it's not give me the desires of my heart. It's give me your desires in my heart, right? So no, that's exactly right. So God's desires should awaken in us godly desires, right? That reorder our desires in a positive way. And that can actually allow us then to use language we otherwise might avoid like the plague and to know, A, the problems with it and B, the problems with all other language, right? So there isn't any solution in language, actually. The solution is by, by the desires of our heart. So that was a beautiful way to end. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. So thank you. I know we're out, we're out of time, but thanks everyone online. It's great to see you and we will see you in October. <laughs>